Okay, thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar where we are going to be discussing the impact of preprints for early career researchers. I'm Iratsu Puebla, Associate Director at ASAP Bio, and I'm delighted to be here mostly just to help host the session where we have a wonderful lineup of speakers and, and moderator for today. Uh, we are going to get started shortly uh, while we make sure that everyone is joining. If you want to maybe say hello and tell us where you are today, where are you joining from in the chat, feel free to do so. Uh, and like that, we'll get the engagement going. Uh, but again, we're going to get started very soon. Okay, I think we can go ahead. I wanted to uh, give a little bit of an introduction into the topic. Um, before I dive into that, also cover a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording the webinar today and we will be making it available after the session. Um, something I wanted to highlight as well for you is that um, we encourage you to post questions to our panelists at any point during the session. You can do so through the Q&A box that you should see on the toolbar on your screen, the, the Zoom toolbar. Uh, I also wanted to highlight that you have the option of posting your questions anonymously if you wish. There is a little box at the bottom of the Q&A field if you prefer to do it that way. There should also be the option of, of upvoting questions if there is any particular question that somebody else has posted and you are interested in. Um, as I mentioned, you should have also the chat uh, field available if you want to uh, react to anything that has been discussed or maybe some resources that may be useful to others here today, feel free to do so through the chat. But a reminder to use the Q&A box for the questions for our speakers. Okay, I'm having that cover. Um, and before we get into the topic, um, I wanted to give a little bit of introduction, a lot of credit to the people behind um, this work. For anyone who is not familiar with ASAP Bio, we are a nonprofit uh, with a mission to drive innovation and transparency in life sciences communication. And we do quite a bit of work to try to promote the use of, uh, uh, of preprints in a productive way for life sciences. Um, we are supported in this by a fantastic community of researchers and others with an interest in preprints. And specifically, there are five of our fellows, so five of our community members who have been working on this project to bring you the webinar today. You can see them listed there. And I'm delighted to say that Katie uh, Seca and Nafisa Yadabji are going to be moderating and speaking today, respectively. So thanks to them for putting this together. All right, so we are here today to speak about preprints. We believe that there are many benefits of preprints. I will just highlight a couple. Preprints allow researchers and early, early career researchers in particular to maximize the reach of their research. Uh, preprints are freely available uh, and accessible to anybody with an internet connection. Preprints can also allow you to receive citations on your work earlier. So perhaps you're saying the preprint before submitting to a journal, you can already start to accumulate citations that way. And in fact, there's been quite a few studies uh, showing that if you decide to submit eventually to a journal as well, the journal articles that have a prior associated preprint tend to get more citations and more attention. So again, another way of, of raising the visibility of your work. There is also Obviously, a very important element here for early career researchers related to credit uh, recognition and assessment. And there has been over the last few years uh, quite a number of funders and institutions who have updated policies to signal recognition for preprints, and they will accept the use uh, of preprints as part of grant applications and reports, which is a fantastic move, of course. Um, I also want to mention this in terms of putting the faces behind the individual examples, because sometimes we talk policies in a very abstract way, but this can have very tangible uh, impact for uh, researchers and early career researchers in particular in helping them progress in their career path. Um, again, I encourage you to watch this interview with Gautam Day. The interview is also another project, by, uh, another group of ASA Bio fellows, where he talks about how he was looking for uh, a job as a group leader and use his preprint in, in those interviews and these conversations with search committees as a tool to make so that he could present his ideas and his work. 
So there can be many specific benefits to, to researchers. And also another thing that maybe we'll explore today as well is that the impact can go beyond the individual preprint that you posted. Sometimes other colleagues in the community may see your work, get interested in, in collaborating with you. It can be a door to open collaborations, put your work and your group on the radar for journals. There are some journals who now appointed editors who look at the latest preprints and uh, invite submissions to the journals. And it can also be a way of perhaps making connections with others in the community. We have, a, as I mentioned, a community within ASAP Bio, but there are others with an interest in preprints, open science, et cetera. So it can be a way of, again, increasing your profile and, and getting noticed in the community. So, and so we're going to be exploring many of these things today. But with that, I'm going to hand over to Katie Seca, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University College London, who, are, who is going to be moderating the discussion. So over to you, Katie. Thank you very much, Irache. And hi, everybody. It is very exciting to have people from all over the globe, actually, which are willing to better know about uh, preprints. We have an incredible, rich and diverse panel of speakers today, and I would like to start from the first one, which is uh, Joao Victor Cabral Costa, PhD candidate at the University of uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Joao, please tell us something about yourself and why your interest in preprints. No, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to share this, this space with you all. Uh, well, um, as uh, Kachizeka told, I'm um, a PhD candidate studying biochemistry, um, more specifically mitochondrial physiology and brain metabolism here at the University of Sao Paulo. I, uh, I'm Brazilian and I, I've been doing research uh, for, for uh, here for, for quite a while. And well, I, since the beginning of my, my, my career, I was an enthusiast. I was always an enthusiast in science, science communication. I participated in many um, events like FameLab, Point of Science. I co-created one of um, um, science public outreach of science uh, program here, a national one called Nunca Vi Un Cientista, which basically then translates to, I have never seen a scientist, to demystify the view of scientists uh, to, the, the, to the to the general public. And I also participated in other um, uh, volunteer work, but one specifically which kept, put me into this, this uh, type of discussion, which what is called evidence-based beer, which is basically a discussion of evidence-based policy in healthcare uh, in a pub. And uh, I had the opportunity to discuss preprint and the role of preprint and how the, the, the uh, publishing system, the publishing business in science works, but to people that are not, is not in, in research, usually for uh, policymakers and, and um, healthcare workers while drinking a pint. So, uh, and this was a really nice opportunity to start with this, but uh, even before, since my master's, I was thinking about science transparency, data availability, and real-time discussion, open science, all these topics, because uh, it was everything quite new to me. And we were, I at least, wasn't putting this into action. So I tried to read a little more, and even though in a shy manner, starting to advocate for these topics. And I still haven't yet published a preprint myself, but currently my in my lab, all the major research, primary research articles are being uh, preprinted as a, uh, as a standard and uh, one of which I was a co-author already. And I, tended, I intend to preprint all my thesis papers. I'm, I mean, it's, uh, if it's possible, I'm gonna do that uh, for the, the sake of it. And we're gonna uh, discuss this a little more later. And, but one thing that actually put me a lot more in, the, the, this, in the, this context was to always try to discuss preprints in journal clubs. So I actually participated in two journal clubs, one from my lab and also another one from, from metabolic researchers all around the world that we, we discuss uh, different topics every week. And I always try to put up some preprints and I have actually some nice stories within this uh, because some of them really helped uh, to shape my thesis and the project from the beginning. And we can come back to this later, but uh, I always try to, to discuss them and put them a little more in the day-to-day -day routine in my lab. Oh, it's nice to meet you all. Thank you, Joao. It's quite interesting and 
uh, actually fantastic for me, especially because I'm interested in um, metabolism. So I will keep in mind some of your advice today. And uh, with that, I would like to go to the next speaker, to Nafisa Jadavi, which is an early principal investigator in Midwestern University, US, and Carlton University in Canada. Nafisa, please, could you tell something about yourself and why preprinting? Sure, thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm happy to be involved with this webinar. Um, so I started my independent research group in 2019 at Midwestern University in the US. And uh, Midwestern is a healthcare university. Uh, so we train um, uh, doctors, uh, pharmacists, dentists, and, and all sorts of other healthcare professionals. So my responsibilities include the typical faculty um, load, uh, research, teaching, and service. Since starting my research group, um, I've tried to preprint um, all of our papers, our research papers. Um, uh, so we've published, uh, or we're we're working on three three data papers, two of which I believe are published, and one is in review. And we've posted them all on BioArchives. Um, I've also worked with collaborators internationally through different initiatives, and we've um, posted our preprints online, um, either on BioArchives or OSF or archive.org. And so um, I think that's been really beneficial as an early career researcher. Um, I've included preprints um, in my yearly uh, review as a, um, in terms of product productivity. Um, our university currently doesn't have any policies on them in terms of whether they count towards your productivity. Um, but I do uh, make a point of listing them, <laughs> um, what I've posted online in my reviews, and I hope that they will soon develop some sort of policy on them. Um, I also applied for a, an R15 grant here in the U.S. with the National Institutes of Health in uh, 2020, and I included my preprints from um, my research group in that application. Um, again, um, I think, uh, just next slide, I think that these um, uh, preprints have helped um, display some productivity on my grant applications. Um, you know, I've applied to both NIH and the National Science Foundation for grants. So listing, having this opportunity to list those um, uh, uh, data papers that have come out from my lab have shown some productivity, especially with the long peer review process, which has further, you know, been uh, lengthened with the current state of affairs in the world. And I think another great benefit of preprints is the feedback that you get from paper, uh, from posting preprints, excuse me. Um, and um, I think that's vital. Um, it's really important. Um, I think in the sense of getting uh, information uh, or enhancing your study or your data interpretation, I really enjoy that aspect of it. Um, you know, I know that I've mentioned that my university doesn't have a policy yet in terms of preprints and whether they count as, you know, um, productivity or not, but I plan to continue to, to report them and to post them um, because I think they're really important. Um, you know, in helping students in my lab, as well as myself, um, and, you know, getting that information, that data out, um, and getting feedback on the data, which I think is uh, really great, and the community around them, um, around preprints, I think, is really supportive. So, um, yeah, that's just a brief summary of how I've used preprints and how I find them to be uh, beneficial for early career researchers. Thank you, Nafisa. That's absolutely great and very uh, an inspiration, actually, for whichever is uh, meant to do the next step uh, for independence. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will then go to Ian Chisman, which is a senior principal investigator at White Hat Institute in US. Please, Ian, tell us something briefly about your amazing career and Thank you. Uh, about preprint. Excellent. So, I, I, you know, I've I've uh, been faculty for 14 years now. I'm probably the senior person on on this webinar, 
And I was actually thinking about this and like how to describe what I've seen change during my career. So I, I started grad school in 1997. And, you know, the stories I can tell you about what publications look like then, to submit a paper, you printed your paper, four copies with color figures, and you sent them by FedEx to the journal. And then, you know, those papers got distributed and they went to the reviewers. And, you know, to me, it's like, it was just kind of natural at that time. And now you tell this as a story and it's like the stone age, like how could we possibly be doing that or not having online supplemental, you know, material so that you could, you know, not just have to say data not shown. Okay. And to me, preprints is like that. And it's going to be one of those things that, you know, you're all of you on this webinar are going to be telling this story this someday about how there used not to be preprints. And it used to be that you had to, you know, maybe wait two years to publish your paper and that you were handcuffed from being able to apply for jobs or, you know, graduate with your PhD or, you know, other things like that. And for me now, you know, although we're still talking about something that's relatively recent, you know, the past five to seven years where this has become just the way that things work and mainstream, it's something that I take for so much for granted these days, just in terms of how we do science and, and how we operate. And, you know, like, okay, again, thinking about the, the, the Stone Age era, it was a very hard thing for me to figure out how to time my faculty applications in terms of ensuring that my papers were out. And certainly for myself, for our lab now, you know, it's just a thing where, you know, we don't have to worry about the date that a journal arbitrarily accepts it and it comes out in press. The presence of that preprint has been remarkably useful for my own applica grant applications, you know, fellowship applications, grant, uh, you know, job applications for people in our lab. It's also something where, you know, I'm a pretty active reviewer of grants elsewhere um, and, um, you know, job applications for faculty positions at our institute. For me, there really is no difference between a preprint and a published paper. I go look at, at the science, at the data, you know, what did they do? What did they, you know, what did the person show and, and say? Uh, you know, I, I don't distinguish those when I consider someone's productivity or whether they're a good fit for someone here. We've certainly um, hired people as faculty in my institute whose, you know, major work was um, under consideration, but because that preprint was there, um, you know, that was great. This, this is what they had, had done and accomplished. The one thing I did want to say, because I think we're going to cover a lot of these just, you know, selfish uses of, of the preprint. And I think it's good for the way that science works, but it's good for each of us individually as scientists. What I've noticed recently is that we can start using this to drive forward communication and input on our own work in, in a way that just I, I never anticipated would be the case. And so, you know, you can do this thing to be able to advance your career, communicate your science rapidly. We recently came across a um, you know, very unexpected and serendipitous finding. And this is uh, work from a um, grad student in our lab, Alex uh, Navarro. And she came across this protein that we mostly work on cell division, centromeres. She found this small little peptide that localized the Golgi. And it, it sort of blew our mind, but we had no idea where to begin. And so she put together this initial um, work and she posted it as a preprint, but in a way that was really clear that we wanted that feedback. And the information that we got from, you know, the people from BioArchive and from Twitter and elsewhere was so influential in shaping that. You know, people who actually invested their time to go analyze that, the evolution of this, the conservation of it, um, you know, the hydrophobicity of this is a transmembrane domain. And so we've continued to update this preprint periodically in ways that just would have been very hard for our lab to do otherwise. And so being able to get input at an early stage, not the reviewers going like, oh, okay, you, this is what you need to get it accepted. But people across the globe genuinely providing supportive, constructive, and you know, helpful feedback to shape the science that we're doing. And so I think continuing to, you know, our lab will certainly continue to um, post preprints for um, things that you know, are, are completed stories and we're ready to be submitted to a journal. But I think being able to utilize this at this early stage really can change the nature of the science that you're doing and, and to make it as best as it, as it um, can be. And have, you know, realize that science is small and you, you have great opportunities to talk with people, you know, not just that you happen to bump into in a meeting, but, but across the globe. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I, I think, you know, it's all good and it will continue to, to change and transform just the way that science works and what's feasible. Um, and for those of you who live pre pre era, you'll be able to come back and tell stories about it someday and people are just not going to believe you. But. Thanks, Ian. It's really fascinating, especially the Stone Age era. So we might get as well as so famous. We hope so. 
With that, I would like to then go to the next speaker, which is Hannah Hope. Hannah is a project manager in open and open research in Wellcome Trust here in the UK. Hannah, please tell us something about yourself and why you're interested in preprint. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Kathy, and thanks to all the other speakers. Uh, I, I guess the disadvantage of going last is that everything that I wanted to say has already been spoken. Um, but I will do my best to add something new to it. So I work at Welcome. As Kathy said, I am involved in the Open Research and Research Environment team. I uh, long ago did work in a lab for a PhD and I have been through the pain of publishing. I, I don't quite remember the, the stone age that Ian described, but uh, there certainly weren't preprints around when I was doing my work. And, and really uh, Ian took the, the line that I wanted to, to discuss with you. You know, from a, as, a, as a funder, we're looking to create knowledge and solve problems. And the value of a piece of work any kind of work really depends on how it's communicated and and for and so that's where preprints come in they are this really exciting open flexible prompt communication tool there is minimal barriers to authors to publish individuals to comment and and readers to read and and that's really exciting i think for for what research can do and how people can interact with it, who can interact with it, how can it be improved, can we iterate it? Um, and that, that, that's really, you know, as, as an organization, as a funder, that's what we're excited by. You know, looking at speed of publication, welcome, we've got an interest in epidemics. Rapid communication of results in preprints is vital to informing how we uh, design our future funding, the policy in interventions that we're we're looking to make with with governments and and you know health delivery bodies. In terms of open and and flexibility, I mean, really, Ian's example was was brilliant. I mean, we hope that researchers, or we we believe research should be empowered in how they communicate their research. They, you, you guys know who you need to talk to, um, how best to describe the research that you're doing, whether it is an open question that you're asking people or, or are you looking for technical validation through a, a kind of peer review process. And we think that preprints give that, that option to you. Not everything needs pre-reviewing uh, you may not be at that point and, and other things you may want to get peer reviewed, but you also need them to be public while that peer review process is going on. Um, and that's whether that's to demonstrate research outcomes to employers or whether you're looking to share the findings of uh, your impacts with uh, colleagues. Uh, from a welcome perspective, what we've actually done in practice in 2017, we started recommending the use of preprints. We hadn't previously had an active policy for or against them, but in 2017, we changed our grant application forms and end of grant forms to specifically mention preprints and give a, a format for how you could cite them to researchers. And then in uh, 2022, last year, as part of our open access policy, we recommended that all researchers should preprint articles prior to going to a journal. And where the researchers are working in kind of epidemic public health situations, we require them to preprint their work. We, we don't want to wait for the, the, the journal publication process. And we're not alone in doing that. Many other funders have done that. Uh, the vast majority of journals uh, support their use, support their citation. Obviously check the small print, particularly with funder applications, but I think as a research community, it's really important that you advocate for the research communication methods that you want. You know, I think it's brilliant, Nafisa, that you are including your preprints within university forms when there is no policy against them. I think, you know, that's absolutely what we, we need researchers to do because that's how we, we know that there are things that we need to change and, and, and look at. 
Um, in terms of funder policies, um, you know, it's, it's hard to avoid potentially submitting to a funder who, who would be uh, against a particularly a national funder, but certainly for journals, I think in addition to lobbying, it's, it's very important to think, you know, whether if, if a journal isn't supporting a communication mode that you think is really vital to how science is done, should you submit to that, that journal, you know, um, in addition to whether you lobby them around their policies. Um, yeah, and I'm sure we'll come on to lots of other stuff. And so I will leave time for that uh, discussion. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. It's really encouraging, actually, to have your point of view as speaking from the funder's perspective for um, each of us. So I'm really happy, actually, to have uh, to hear all your positive experience uh, with preprinting. Um, however, um, we know very well that early career researchers are not the ones that are the decision makers to preprint or not. So what kind of advice you would give to an early career researcher that wants to preprint and wants to discuss this with um, his her supervisor or his colleague and i would address this uh, question directly to starting from joao and to ian then all right thank you um well to me i have the the, the honor and the luck to be in an environment that is pre-print supportive actually it's supportive in 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 every manner i mean uh, regarding the the environment of research so i have total the, the total support of my supervisor but I've seen other contexts that, that you know the, the context not the same so I would say that you know like three pillars or three ways of paving of, of tips to help um, starting the discussion of preprints from the point of view of a person uh, that is uh, in a position like me um, the first of the first of things is to raise awareness of preprints because even though uh, to us that we're in environments that we are discussing preprints in journal clubs, we're preparing ourselves, we're um, revising preprints, we're um, re reviewing papers uh, in journals as reviewers that were uh, preprinted before, but there's a lot of people, a lot of labs that still see preprints as something, some uh, very specific niche uh, thing or, uh, to do in the lab. So to raise awareness of preprints is very important uh, in, in a context of this, so to start a discussion within the lab, in, in lab meetings, with, uh, with meetings one-on-one -on -one with the supervisor, but not only talking about the pros, because usually I know you, the other supervisors that I hear that are more senior than me can uh, always know when a student are talking only about the pros of something or something new in the lab, but the cons, specifically in the point of the of preprint, is important to discuss, because the second point is considering the risk, the risks, wait for the advantages so um to, to do this balance and discuss open discuss the balances uh, of the of preprinting one's thesis one's dissertations or collaboration but uh, not only uh reinforcing the advantages but balancing with the risks of preprinting uh, especially if we're coming from underprivileged uh research centers or the developing countries where the pace of of uh science development is could be can be quite different, uh, quite uh, slower than in the developing world. And the third thing is to, as I said, that was how I, I got more into preprints, to put preprints into the, the daily routine, put preprints into the day-to-day the -day, uh, activity of the labs. So I, if I'm not wrong, I was the first one to present a preprint in my lab. So the, the thing that I, that I did was to say, well, I know this is not published data, so this is even better because uh, in a lab meeting, we usually desiccate the paper and, you know, sometimes positively, sometimes more negatively than, than in a positive manner. But doing to preprints is good because it's there also for this. So to put this in, in today's day, day to day manner, we can think and well, it, when, it, and when it gets to my time, I can do this as well. And, and maybe someone, someone in another lab is going to discuss this paper and a collaboration can arise or a, a, a critic can be key to correct the paper before submission or during submission. And I've heard stories like that. So I think this three ways, um, three pillars is a good way to introduce a discussion in a context that a preprint is still something that 
like a forbidden word or unknown word. That's very, very impressive. I think I, I will use the, in the next lab meeting, probably then. <laughs> Thanks. Ian, what do, what do you say about it? No, that was a beautiful description. I actually, I learned a lot from listening to that too. And thank you very much. You know, I, I think for me, every paper, the, the ownership often really is that first author. And I, I tend to think about the choices that we make for that paper being based on what is best for that first author and what their perspectives are. And so I, I think that the first author indicating that that's their desire to submit the preprint is, is something I would take really seriously, even if that was something that was completely new uh, to me and unexpected. And I like that description of the balance and trade-offs. I, I, I genuinely think that the sort of downsides are uh, uh, for this are so, so low that there's, and that the upsides outweigh that. But I think that often when we encounter something new, we tend to be quite conservative, like, I've never done that before. Why would I, why would I do that? And so I think that indicating the strong need, for example, for the first author of why this is very important for, you know, their future career or grants that they're applying for or things like that. I think that argument can carry a large sway. I think one thing that Zhao didn't mention is um, that I do think is important is that there used to be this sort of rush to publication that was like, who, who got there first? And, you know, like by, oh, your, your, your thing came out a week earlier, you won, you know, that like you're the one who discovered this. And we know it doesn't work that way. And I think that actually genuinely a preprint provides a very nice way to frame your role and involvement in a discovery that I think that it allows you as long as that um, review process can be, the publication process can be, to stake that ownership. And actually, there's a benefit for, um, you know, the authors in the lab, just in terms of, um, um, you know, scooping protection at many journals um, for, um, you know, publication of a preprint, you know, that sort of awareness in the field and of, of where things um, went. Um, but, you know, I, I think it is always should be a, a discussion um, a, about, you know, the, the relative merits. And I, I think that, mostly the experience that I've seen for so many people I know is that they try it once and they're like, why are we just not doing this for, for everything? And, you know, I think that you, it's worth, it's worth making, you know, sure that a lab can, can do that maybe for something that isn't as high stress for, for them for whatever reason, but once, once you really see that and, and just how much advantages there are um, with, you know, really negligible downsides, I, I think that then you, you convert pretty easily over to that new era. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed hearing what y'all said um, about having that conversation and, and raising awareness just of preprints in general. Fantastic. So given these uh, benefits of preprints, how can an early career researcher make the best of the preprints to raise their profile um, and make sure then that preprint is counted uh, as part of their research assessment? And I would address this to first with Nafisa and then to Hannah. Nafisa, you are unmuted. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, the, the phrase of the year, right? <laughs> um, so I think that there are several benefits of, of preprints, um, like I mentioned. And I think um, in terms of raising their profile, I think that it's important to um, have discussions about them and and the benefits of preprints with, you know, different um, groups. Uh, so I had mentioned, um, you know, my university doesn't have any policies yet on preprints, but I'm still including them in, in my yearly reviews. Um, and I plan to continue to do that and, you know, ask my dean, um, what are the policies? You know, are there any policies this year? Um, um, that the university has has developed, you know, there's a lot of policies that have been developed in the U.S. with the funding agencies in terms of preprints um, being um, their um, ability to be included in applications. So I think that university universities need to follow suit in that. And I think having these discussions about the benefits of preprints and our experiences with them is really important, as well as um, 
uh, pro pro uh, promoting preprints. So I make sure to, you know, post on um, social media. So I'm an avid Twitter um, person, <laughs> or I, I guess I tweet. <laughs> um, so I, you know, try and advertise um, or not advertise, but promote the preprints that our lab has posted. Um, and other preprints that I find really interesting um, that I've read. And I think just raising that awareness, um, we discuss, we have journal club in our, our group, in our research group. And so trying to, um, you know, incorporate preprints about that uh, um, in those journal clubs and educating the students um, about preprints and the benefits of them, I think is really um, important. So I think as an advocate for preprints, I think having these discussions with different groups and advocating for them is really important and plays a, a role in raising their, their profile. <laughs> I, I like the educated, the new generation. <laughs> That's a very good topic. Hannah, what do you would say about this? I, I, th I think Nafis is spot on and, and, and Joao as well, really, you know, we need to talk about them, use them, dissect them, show that they have equivalent value, if not at times greater value to a, a, a published peer review article. Um, you know, research assessment is going through a period of change. Uh, many, many funders are, are altering how they assess research productivity, looking at different assessment formats from uh, the resume to research style, uh, and, and more generally trying to diversify what, what counts as a research output. And I think that is really, really important. Um, you know, Ian touched on communication and you know, a journal article is not always the right way to communicate a piece of work and communicating in it, you know, for example, in a, you know, uh, an international English speaking journal may, actually, may may be great for a research assessment, but, but actually in terms of the practical impact that it could have on a specific uh, research community or community of practice is negligible relevant relative to the impact it could have had if it had been published in a different language or in a community journal, for example. And, and so we need to change research assessment that, so that it's looking at not only what was done, but you know, what, what were the outcomes of that? And that involves taking a step back from, from a, a, a publication, you know, a citation in a, in a research assessment um, form, whether that's end of grant or, or an advance of, of grant. Um, but in terms of you know making them count and raising the profile, absolutely, just keep keep using them. Fantastic suggestion, Ben, <laughs> for each of us. Ben, um, given all uh, these benefits and the rise as well of the preprints, I would I would be quite interested to understand or to hear better your views in um, how these benefits can materialize for early career researchers in different geographical areas, given that we are like a bit random all over the globe today, it will be very nice to start from Joao and then each of you that would like to add anything, please feel free. Well, it's hard to, to complete with such a, a, a nice discussion, rich discussion. I think mostly basically all the topics that I, I, I would comment in this question uh, have already been touched. Uh, the, first of what, the first of them is uh, something that Ian told uh, regarding the, the, the benefit of scooping, because this is something that I think is the, the most important drawback the advantage, but at the same time, the most important drawback that uh, preprints can imprint here uh, in, in a context that I'm here in Brazil. I mean, I mean, the, the, the biggest university in Brazil we have top-notch research as well, but we have some, uh, um, we can see that resources sometimes is the really rate limiting step in the, the, the doing of science. Sometimes I get, get to me like three months to import some reagent that when I was in Spain, I could get in like three working days. 
And uh, this type of stuff, sometimes if you preprint, um, this is something that occurred. Sometimes if you preprint a work that is, you know, is still yet to be completed or, you know, could uh, advantage some, for some of the review process to get better, to improve a little. Um, if you have a competitive, I mean, this shouldn't happen in science, but we, we know that sometimes it happens, a competitive or some, someone that is across the globe that is doing science that is quite similar to you. And, you know, you still could see some time of school, but I don't see this as a limiting. I, I see the benefits way more than this. And actually the advantage of preprint kind of protects you uh, in the way that Ian discussed. I mean, you're showing if this, this shouldn't be important, but if it's important to someone, if it's still important to some journals, if it's still, it's still important to some funders, you're showing that this is something novel that you're doing and you're preparing first. And so this uh, scoop exposure, but at the same time, scoop protection that you can have uh, with preprint is something that I see that in uh, developing countries uh, could be something that's still at the point of debate or uh, anxiety in preparing but at the same time could be a solution, a problem that we, we, we could have we were seeing. I saw at least in the, in the last 10 years. Um, also, the other two things is just, uh, it allows for collaborations. Uh, I actually, it happens to me that I, uh, I saw preprint in my area and because of the preprint, I had the opportunity to discuss uh, with the, the, the person that described the protein that I'm, that I'm studying. So, you know, this type of access to discuss the, the, the preprint and, and exchange data was something that really helped me because being far from, uh, you know, the biggest centers of, of research in Europe or the meeting, especially now that we're basically everybody's virtual, uh, I got the opportunity to do this kind of corridor talk uh, uh, on this data. And also because preprint is not only, uh, is, could be actually better than open science. We're discussing, you know, the coalition and the open science and everything, but preprint is go further than open science because we are talking about actual real time and free science. So uh, in universities where, you know, it's hard to get access through the library to all the papers and it could be time consuming to write every single author of the papers you want to read or, I mean, or using, uh, non-legal uh, debatable sources of papers, uh, this could be limiting. And, uh, you know, this type of access really uh, gets the, the, the pace of science uh, a lot, catalyzes a lot. What shaped my, my uh, the example that I, that I, I told when I introduced myself, uh, when I was in one of the, my first, first year, first or second year of my thesis, I uh, presented a preprint, which was the first in my lab. And this preprint was only published almost two years later. And it actually, it actually uh, uh, shaped the, the, the question that I had because I had an hypothesis and the data that they had, they reinforced what was basically the same in the publication two years later. Uh, and it actually helped me a lot in almost two years of research. So I could have been pursuing some data for two years unnecessarily. So this is something that really helped, especially when resource is, is limiting. And that's why I think this could be, you know, not only time saving, but also resource saving and catalyzing collaboration and research uh, in a complete holistic manner. Fantastic, Joao. Imagine the poor first author of that paper after two years <laughs> struggling. We empathize with that a lot. Anyone, any other of the panelists that want to address this question or has some comments on it? Maybe just to add and like reflecting again on some really nice comments there as well. Um, you know, the science, the world that I want to live in, you know, is, is not this zero sum game. And I think that a lot of the sort of wording that we're using today is, is you know, this, this sometimes is fear that if somebody else does this, then that lessens, um, you know, what it is for, for me too. I think everybody can win. And, you know, I think that there is, you know, many times papers that I've been involved with where multiple labs have found similar things around the same time. And I don't think that took away from the discoveries that anybody made. And so being able to understand and coordinate is, is really important. I think that all of us, all of us can, can figure out how to navigate um, that ability to, to succeed. And I think preprints are good for that. I think the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is why we're doing all of this and that what is the value of biomedical research? And, you know, it's pretty tremendous what, you know, science has 
you know, accomplished over the past two years, over the past 10 years. And it's that ability for us to, you know, make fundamental discoveries, but to push that forward to cures, you know, whether that be, you know, COVID or, you know, many other diseases that, that ail us. It is our responsibility as scientists to do everything that we can to as quickly move forward those discoveries and not, you know, unnecessarily duplicate efforts. Um, and, you know, I think that that's um, a, a strong value of being able to accelerate all of our work, facilitate that communication. I think I see all of the preference as being selfish things for me. You know, it's a good thing for me. It's a good thing for my lab. But I also think it's a good thing for science and, and understanding, you know, why we're all here collectively trying to, you know, solve these important problems is critical too. Beautiful words, Ian. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I really agree with uh, that. Please, if I, if I, um, you know, I think thinking about um, that uh, not only is it about how we communicate and, and talk about science, but I think it's also important that um, preprints by their uh, open nature kind of bring more people to the table and can increase who is having the conversation, who is involved. Uh, I think that there can be through journals um, kind of gating of research, you know, what is interesting, what do the editors deem as interesting? Mm -hmm. uh, and and preprints removes by, by not having an editor actually kind of increases an opportunity and a diversity of, of what research we're able to look at and can get access to, which is, I think, really important. Absolutely, Hannah, you're um, very much right. So with this, um, I don't know if Nafisa, would you like to add anything else anymore? No, I think the, the rest of the panelists have done a really great job addressing. Fantastic, yeah. So with that, otherwise I would continue. Uh, Irache, do we have any Q&A that um, we would like to, to touch? Yes, we have a few um, interesting questions from the attendees. I think I'm going to go on the basis of the votes. So starting with a question from Sandra. Um, she's asking, oh, I guess the context here is to say there are many funders and institutions that are coming on board with preprints, but it's not necessarily unanimous. So she's asking, what do you think are the main concerns preventing review committees or funding agencies uh, in terms of accepting preprints as productivity readouts? Oh, well, this I think that is a proper question for Hannah again, <laughs> and maybe Ian on the very big top panels. We are the, the rest is too young yet. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I think Ian actually hit the answer. Some of this it's it's around the, just the fact that it's it's new. Um, the funders, uh, like many big agencies, are intrinsically conservative, and uh, changing things takes time, and people get nervous about doing that. Um, so I, I, th I think there's an inertia issue in, in getting over that. Well, it's, it's, it's new, it's different. I mean, well, if we change all of our forms and then people stop using them, that, that's, you know, what was the point of doing that? I, th I think there is, that is some of uh, the issue. I think there is also potentially an aspect, um, and it, it shouldn't be, that I think some bodies may be, concerned about the absence of peer review um and and there was a, a question uh posed in the q a which i i answered about whether i as a funder would view uh, a preprint versus peer-reviewed research differently and as ian said when he was talking you know they are the same they should be treated the same i mean the peer review as i frequently state is not some kind of you know everything's good badge um you know there are there are as many issues in peer reviewed articles as there are in in, in preprints potentially you you can still assess the data and and you can still uh it's, it's still evidence of research being done you know as a funder that's often what you're you're looking at and you can assess the the quality of 
the methods that have been described and and all of these kind of aspects so I, I think some people are nervous about the absence of peer review but I don't I don't think that we necessarily should be particularly when we're looking at um research um, or, um sorry um looking at um, assessing productivity, for example, you know, I, I really don't think there is any difference between a, a preprint and a peer reviewed article, but I, I think that might be uh, what some organisations are concerned about. Just to add really quick, that, that was beautiful. And, and again, I think it's really spot on in, in terms of how we're thinking, uh, how, how I think about things really nicely described. I think one other thing just to say, you know, all of you who are tuning in for this today, obviously are, are interested and, and invested in this. And it's really important to highlight that each of you has a lot of power and that your voice has power. And that's true on yes. this topic and it's true on, on many topics. And I, I think that, you know, we often look to the funding agencies as being the people who are dictating stuff. But I think that, you know, there is this reciprocity where um, I think there has been dramatic change over the past five years that I see as being really positive that has been led by grassroots and researchers and people raising their voices and saying, I think that this is the way that this should work. And watching yeah. this continually these days, the funders who, who are not on board, when that's highlighted to them, I think that they've tended to be quite responsive, like, oh, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't notice that that was the case where we messed this up and those policies have changed each of you have power to advocate for what makes sense. Yeah, I, I really, um, really strongly agree with that. And it, we, we, will, we won't always respond, but there'll be people inside these funding organizations and these, in, these universities that want to make change. And if you don't ask for it, they don't have a grounds for really pushing it through. So yeah, absolutely. You you do as individuals have power to make changes to the research community, and we all, as individuals, need to to push for those changes. Brilliant words. Thank you. Uh, any other question, Irache? That is I'm super sorry, that, Yeah, there is something I wanted to mention. That I think it may be brief, and but it ties a little bit to the discussion with Hannah and Ian. There was a question from Frank for Nafisa because she mentioned that her university doesn't have a policy on preprints. Although she also mentioned that speaking about to the dean, which was very encouraging. Um, so he wondered if you have plans to lobby. And I guess that there is also a mention to ASAP Bio. I saw some resources, but I guess also perhaps if, if she wants to talk a little bit about whether there is any ways in which we can support her in this endeavor. Um, so I haven't, I'm not sure. Um, I don't have a grand plan yet. <laughs> um, I do plan to bring it up again. We do our faculty evaluations in the spring every year. And so I will bring it up again and ask um, about uh, whether there are any policies. And hopefully, um, I guess now that I've been involved with ASAP Bio, I can reach out and get some uh, resources or some sort of information um, and, and perhaps, you know, uh, help educate the dean um, of our of our college on the the benefits um, uh, of pre-printing for rec for research and research productivity so um yeah i don't have a plan yet, yet. <laughs> um, but i'm hoping to to continue raising my voice and asking questions um, and hopefully someone will listen <laughs> any other question? I think we're probably going to um, uh, do one more question, uh, given yes. the time that we have left. There is um, an interesting question from Delia saying that actually preprints have been used in physics for much longer, as you know, archive is now into its 30th year. Is there anything in terms of promoting and advancing preprints in the life science that we can learn from that field? Again, what are the lessons that we can, you know, can we take a um, a page from the archive book and apply it to support preprints in the life sciences. Joao, would you like to answer to this since you are involved from a long time? 
well, a long time for a, a really, really Not early yet research a career age, could be though. something. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. This is something that I've been um, thinking about at first because the first time that I heard about, I mean, I don't have the answer, just a spoiler of this. Um, and I, the first time that I heard about preprinting was from my supervisor and because of contact with friends, she actually told about the archive experience. Uh, one of her uh, friends from, from the physics department, I think he, he or a collaborator had actually a paper that never get, got published, was just a preprint, but had a lot of impact because, you know, the preprint it was actually uh, live um, reviewed, you know, in the, the, the field that you can, you know, post comments and they updated the paper uh, and so on. And I think the final form of the preprint was enough contribution to the scientific community uh, in that case. I mean, I don't think this should be the thing, but um, uh, to me, the impression that I got from this, this, this year that I, uh, I was starting to just to, to actually study and understand what was happening is that this is something as a uh, community feeling. So as long as we can develop a, a community feeling that uh, preprinting is a contribution to the society as a whole, as Ian uh, already told, you know, how, how uh, we believe that science should be uh, uh, and the way that, that Afiza and Hannah and, and everybody told, you know, contributed to, to, to the point of you know, the policies and how people consider the importance of, of, of preprinting. Uh, I think basically it's just um, advocating and creating the sense of community. I think this could be a, a way, but I, I actually am, I'm sorry, but I wouldn't, I don't have an idea to start, the, you know, an answer, a practical answer on this topic. Give it some experience. <laughs> and then, as Ian said, with the Stone Age, you will repeat it. I will tell the story. In a couple I of think, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think uh, the, the work that Asap Bai is doing and, and the work that all of you are doing and talking about and using these preprints, that, that is how you... That's how Archive grew to become the, the staple form of communication. I think what's interesting uh, for me from a communications perspective is that they still, a lot, a lot of these papers go to journals. I mean, do we, do we need journals? I mean, it, it, you mentioned there as well that some of the articles on archive authors feel that they have enough review and comments to, to, to never take it to a journal. They revise that version, they revise the preprint, and, and maybe it stays just as a preprint. And I think that is conceptually quite an interesting thing to, to think about whether you overlay preprints, uh, sorry, overlay review on preprints or, or whether preprints stay, you know, do, does a preprint, does an article always have to go to a journal? Um, and I think this is part of the evolution of how we communicate research that Ian was talking about. And um, yeah, I think it would be really interesting to see where it can go. <clears throat> and maybe the life sciences should go in a different direction to archive, who knows? Very interesting point, Hannah. That might be an inspiration for our next webinar, actually, how preprinting can um, interface with the proper journal, the traditional one. I don't know, Irache, if I have time for last question or we are running out of time we have a couple of minutes so if you if you have this final brief question and everyone is yeah you know, I, I would just I would like to conclude with a final question to each of the of the panelists so if you would like to summarize in just one sentence why early career researchers should uh, use preprints now what would it be Joao, do you want to start again? Well, it can be. <laughs> um, I believe that real-time science requires real-time development, real-time discussion, and real-time transparency. I think it kind of sums up. Fantastic. Nafisa? Um, I think uh, preprints are a great way to, to share your research and great and get uh, uh, feedback and move your field forward. Great. Ian? 
Good for you. It's good for the science. Great. Hannah? Uh, for me, it was Joao's point. Uh, I think I think that really, he really hit the nail on the head there. Amazing. Many thanks to each and one of you. And thank you to every one of the participants online. And thank you to Irache particularly and Asabaya completely. I will hand over to you now. Yeah, thank you so much again. My thanks as well to all the fantastic speakers today. I've been taking notes myself uh, from all the tips. So thank you so much for that. Thank you to all the attendees for the different questions on the engagement. It's been fantastic to have such a global audience today. Just wanted to share with you again the fact that we have a number of resources on our website. So if you want to learn more about preprints, visit our website. We have a preprint uh, resource center. And if you want to be even more engaged, you're welcome to join our ASAP Bio community. The link is there to join or feel free to contact us with any questions. We'll be happy to discuss it further with you. Um, thank you again for a fantastic discussion. I hope everyone has a lovely rest of the day. Take care.